stories in relationship to what you did, how you stepped into a place where you decided to say something that you felt had not been said. Yeah, I, I also... Or Something simple, but <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I was I was saying to Robbie just now. I said, um, you know, and you're the only one that I don't really know that you told me you were earlier. So I I just want to say that. So forgive me if I ask any silly questions later. But um, you know, and yeah, I'm caught up Thank a little you. bit. But I just remember we were all sort of in the world of downtown New York at the same time. Um, and certainly you, you know, I was saying to Rob, okay, so how do we frame this question? Because the one question that gets us all going, because um, I felt like we were all part of the beauty panel, you know, I mean, like, we were all in this these conversations. So I think, yeah, telling the story of what brought you to that moment of I certainly remember and first meeting you too. Mm -hmm. um, I was a little later than you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also that you worked as a playwright as well, you know. So. Uh, first of all, I, I the thinking about uh, innovation and transforming. I think I have to take a moment back and say transition space. <laughs> because I'm in that transition space of the, all these wonderful performances and panels here. And I'm feeling the body within that transition space. And uh, 
but I'm going to push, push through to get to innovation and transform. <laughs> 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 uh, but I just wanted to indulge for a few minutes. <laughs> that special T word. Uh, so thinking about transforming and innovation, and I think I'm going to start with transforming or I'm going to go to transformation. And uh, it's been so beautiful to see the performances, but also to be hearing about education uh, here and to be at your work with education. And it was a teacher who helped me very much um, when I was asking what to do with pain that I had in my life, so events. And my teacher said to me, transform your pain into compassion. And that was a big opener for, opening for me. Um, is that because I feel politically that voicing a story and telling a story can be sufficient. I think, you know, telling the truth, telling the story and voicing is paramount, uh, you know, especially for stories that haven't been told that we're, you're discussing earlier. But what does one in creating with, and I think speaking of that work is, now I'm just sort of speaking to myself with my eyes closed here in that space, of to, to transform that pain into compassion for the ability the capability of others, and that, that's, that, I think, is a, a, a big starting point for me. <laughs> what was your starting point? What was my starting point? I had so many of them. Uh, I transformed from the child of two musicians, classical musicians, and thinking that I would have a career in classical music as a singer, uh, to meeting an off-off-off-Broadway um, uh, playwright, George Buramisa, who was one of the first um, really candid gay uh, writers. And um, then I started to act with people from the Living Theater, and I read Arto, and then nothing was ever the same. <laughs> and then I ran into the Dada's, and I started working with Dada's material with a great performer by the name of John, um, God help me, John Wilson, John W. Wilson, who worked with Kei Takei, and, and was just a genius. Um, and. Um, but I guess we're oddly, because I found so many different kinds of voices, I had to come across the river as something that I started when I was a child, really, as a writer. And uh, because to me it was the most concentrated, um, intimate, um, pristine form with which to distill my thoughts. And uh, it's one thing to perform other people's words and to interpret, but when you perform your own words and your own journey, and specifically, when you can relate that journey, I mean, I, I'm not a fan of self-indulgent work, but uh, I, I don't think that there's anything that can be said negatively about putting your work through the sluice of your own subjectivity in order to reach a greater objectivity. It creates an oeuvre 
into which you can really just dive in and invest yourself. And um, there are only a few things that I can say about transformation, and one of them is you have to tell the truth. And being a candid person, that's pretty easy for me. <laughs> uh, you have to you have to face your demons. Mm -hmm. And I think we've talked a lot about that on the panel. I don't really need to. <laughs> I think we all know what that one's about. And you have to use everything that you have. All your experiences, good and bad, everything you've heard. I, I love the notion of listening being the most important part of the, the circle. Mm -hmm. Because the listening is where you find that common groove, the foundation, you know, from which to draw <coughs> our similarities. There are so many things as artists that we need to address right now. That's all been talked about as well. Um, but Charlotte was just saying to me, oh, I love the Dada. I just so many <laughs> and I, you know, Dada taught me a lot because, because those were the people who were completely boxed by something that had never happened before in the world, which was the advent of a world war. And these artists just, they could not get it, and it freaked them out. And all they could do is create laughter from such a situation. And we saw that also happen uh, in Yugoslavia. You know, they had the, uh, they had that, they had that cookbook. Does anybody remember that cookbook? Um, well, it's in the air. Uh, people who were under siege wrote a cookbook, and it was, and they were all um, theatrical artists and visual artists, and they were all like living under siege during uh, the war uh, in Bosnia. I think it was a Bosnia cookbook, actually. And they created humor out of their um, their tragedy, which was a real tragedy. Uh, we were once again up against ethnic cleansing. Uh, there's been many ethnic cleansings in the world. Some are happening right now, as we speak and sit here. And still, we have to laugh because laughter is the most profound thing that we can attain to and to understand that deep laugh, just like that deep gasp when, when uh, Demika was, you know, revealed herself. Demika, I guess. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> now I sound just ignorant. No, no that's okay. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but considering that I was asleep about 20 minutes ago, and not because of you guys, but because I had sort of slipped into a low blood sugar thing, and this is something else that's dictated my work is <laughs> being a diabetic, which my Ooh. darling and I share. <laughs> we performed on this very stage together, and uh, we had our little glucose tablets hidden in those different places back there. We talked about that. So, yeah. You take, you take all the prima materia and you jumble it all up, and that's transformation. When you can find a through line from the truth to a vision. Thank you. Well, a transformative moment. I mean, I, I, you know, transform. I mean, I think we all, I think it's all, I think it's constantly about invention and reinvention, yeah? yeah. And I think, uh, as a child, I was a, a teenage actor, and um, and what happened was, you know, because I grew up, you know, in the seventies, and a lot of stuff that was available at the time was, you know, the black musical stuff like that, and in film, there's not you know, there's a lot of you know black exploitation. You know, how many ways can you say? Oh, there's not too many ways you can say this. <laughs> you know? And so, I but also I began to no, I began to write as a kid. And so when I, 1975, uh, you know, the few adults that were around me, I grew up in Harlem in the South Bronx and it was, it was pretty rough back then. And you know, there's a great uh, 
Jungian writer named Aldo Caratanuto, who says knowledge separates you. And I would look at the, who was raising me and the way I was being raised, and I knew that there was an alternative to this, but I just didn't really have access to it. Mm -hmm. And I also began to write then. So like in 1975, I was about to be 16, and this angel of a woman with her two kids brought us down to see for colored girls. Oh, and I saw wow. you on Broadway, oh, wow. and I found out that Endozaki also wrote the piece, and there were a few of us that stood up, and it was myself, Maria, and it was a girl, who, a, a white girl from Long Island, and when Bang Bang came on, Joe Cuba, he got up, <laughs> and they came and said, you guys need to sit down. <laughs> but the point being is that I found out that you could write and be in your own work, that that was the seeds of that. And there was a word that you would use because you had some students, a story that you told early on about you know playing the other, where I met some of your students and the word universalism came in because we were three teenage girls that were different races, different ethnic groups that stood together when that song came up mm -hmm. and we danced. Mm -hmm. Thank you for letting us dance, mm -hmm. giving us permission to dance. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that was the beginning, literally seeing that. And then also after that, I mean, I, I started going to New York and Polish Cafe as a child when I was on Sixth Street. You know, and I would see Zaki read certain things and stuff because, you know, you know, again, you know, but that's, you gave us permission to dance. Mm -hmm. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and also another thing that comes to mind with you, and I'm gonna leave it here, it's uh, I came across a terrific quote. Artists like the saints are the receivers. Their job is to summon every emotion, every skill, to remain skinlessly alert in order, as Picasso says, to find. And the person who wrote that is a woman named Jennifer Lash. Jennifer Lash was the mother of Ray Fiennes. Mm -hmm. oh. She's a brilliant writer. She died right before Schindler's List became, you know. Mm -hmm. But she wrote that. She's a brilliant writer, but she came up with that text, talking about what, what it all, skinlessly alert. That's what you do. You, will, you give us permission to be skinless. Did you have the nerve in you to step into these dangerous places? Uh, someone earlier talked about bravery as a um, bravery or courage. Yeah, Daniel uh, said that. Uh, uh, yeah, I like, I like that you mentioned that. Um, and I think that um, courage is a is a um, aspect of art, and art. Um, but it is also what it is, and so I'm interested in 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 your experience of finding the nerve to go to the light and give voice. Um, and this is a question that could be the first time. I think it's so much a part of the work that it happens all the time. Oh, that, you mean in that time or in no, the I mean, just the work that's I mean, as a performer, mm -hmm. each time you work, you have to get the nerve talk about the nervous and, and everyone says oh it's good to be nervous mm. <laughs> but it's hell to be nervous <laughs> so stories about stepping in something there about the times when we were doing and, and, and all the solo work. Um, uh, and what everyone here 
feel the energy that was around them. So I would say the early 80s into the late 80s, into the early 90s, you know. And certainly, Karen, you were a very public figure. You became us with some other people, became this symbol for a lot of us uh, uh, when uh, the funding got taken away. And you know, you, you became like this sort of no one really, I felt like your name kept cropping up in conversation. What is it they call those things now? M-E-M-E, mm. -E -E. mm. is that how you say it? Mm. 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 You know, who back in the day? Mm. Because um, people who'd never even seen your work would toss your name around like an example of that kind of body work and you know, oh, we should pull the funding up. So it, you, you, had, you were in the light whether you wanted it or not. I mean, certainly, you know, I'm, I'm curious about that kind of public, uh, oh, now I'm, I'm this person that stands for a lot of things, not just who I am, you know, um, whether you want to or not. So there's that. It's probably what happened to you, you know, Sally's rape. Um, and with some of the work, if you experience that. So, and Dale, you know, if you also had experienced that in your solo work, um, I wonder, you know, as women doing that kind of work, when you're talking about going in the light, sometimes that light can be really harsh, too. And we have no control over it. Hmm. You know, I mean, it's how we're seen. Mm -hmm. You know, so just a little bit of that and to throw in to make us all crazy. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> I, I, it's an opportunity to hear from you about yeah. you know, um, all of you. So whoever wants to take it. Um, that's there's a lot there. I know, <laughs> I know, and you know, you can say I don't want to talk about it right now. No, I, I think it's important mm -hmm. to speak about this and. So I think I'll talk about the, I'm going to bring in two points that were brought up, uh, the idea of bravery versus courage, and then also in terms of thinking about how you support censorship at those times during the culture wars, which I was a big part of. Mm -hmm. And I think that I was actually on a trial recently at La Mama, which was just wonderful. Oh. And he put together here, and since it was a really uh, icons for East Village. And uh, we were talking about, uh, brought up about censorship and uh, those times, and they can be these times. But with my age in my experience, I, I have come to realize and to understand that my censorship and what I experienced is really at the expense of many people that were never recognized, in particular artists of color. Because the fact that I was, you know, censored or to be put in, in light uh, is, is, a, is, is a form of racism at the expense of others who were not given a certain visibility or even to be considered uh, to be, have a certain value to be silent because there was not be enough the recognition. I feel that I was not able to express that at my at that time because of the, um, because I was, you know, put into that position of the, you know, white, you know, female body who was uh, hetero, you know, heterosexual in this position. So I think that I was, uh, I was kind of used in my body in that way. Mm -hmm. But what I've realized is that it really isn't I don't think that what I experienced really was really censorship at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when that when people speak about those kind of times in a, with a nostalgia, uh, it makes me very angry. 
Mm. And it also makes me very angry, and that is where I have not risen to that place where I can take that anger and <laughs> transform that into compassion yet. But I also, <laughs> have, I also have a lot of thinking about um, downtown culture and the fact of my complicity of gentrification and that my, uh, my success and my visibility and my position and because being censored then creates a space for me in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've done very well with that. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, so I, 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 could, I could probably speak about that for about another hour, but I won't, I think, to have that. You know, I think it's an important it is a thing to bring up, up and okay. thank you. I mean, that's kind of, I just wanted to open that door a little uh, because uh, hearing everyone talk about uh, the peace valley, it made me think about your people mm -hmm. and, and how they were treated back then. Yes, I think that yeah. there was, uh, what was the year that Sally, did, which I said, I saw that, the work, I was there when we were speaking about it being in the audience and how mm -hmm. beautiful it is to be able to have this opportunity to be with other people that were in the audiences mm -hmm. too, so that it's not an alone experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I'm very grateful to be able to have that moment. But I would like to ask you, what year was it? Because I thought it was 1986 that you wrote, right? What year did you write it? When did you perform it? Was it, uh, it, was, it was later. It was um, 1991. It was, well, officially it was done in 91 at the kitchen. Yes, yeah, so I saw that. Oh, that. Was that the premiere of it? No, I'd done it in work, as a work in progress, in other venues at, at um, PS122. Uh, we did it, and I'm, you know, yeah, I get yeah. the, the times <laughs> and the dates confused, but, um, I wrote it in 89, and Jeannie and I started just working at it. <coughs> the first time I did it, I did it alone at a conference that some people may have been at. A woman performers, Anna Vigo Smith was there, comedy of Tropicana, mm -hmm. um, myself, and some others, mm -hmm. and, um, and that must have been around 89. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I was presenting it as an idea, and I did the moment of me disrobing it. Um, and um, so that, that was done before the kitchen. Mm -hmm. talk uh, very briefly about uh, a moment of personal braveness, I guess. Uh, or fear. I love that. Well, they, they talk about being, you know, They kind of go hand in hand. Right. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I wish I didn't do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why am I doing this? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to overcome your fear in order to be brave. Um, in um, the early 2000s, uh, Judith Molina was doing a piece called Monty and Jane at the Living Theater on Clinton Street, and I asked if I could understudy the role of Monty because she was having a lot of health problems, and I just thought it might be cool if she had some backup. And um, Judith and Hannon had wanted to see me do a run through because I was going to, they we arranged some special performances so that I could perform the role. And uh, um, I had 
there's a nude scene with both women in that show. And I was 56 at the time. And I had never taken my clothes off in public. I mean, sort of, kind of, almost, but, not <laughs> you know, but uh, I've pretty much done everything on stage, giving birth, having sex, <laughs> dying. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Not taking my clothes off. Oh. <laughs> Get that nightgown <laughs> on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you? <laughs> I'm exciting. <laughs> Don't tell me you have. <laughs> Those cold winter nights. <laughs> anyway, there is a thing about being a, a woman of a certain age and taking your clothes off. And it was very, very challenging to me. And uh, the lighting person was not there that day. Mm -hmm. And so we did the whole thing in orb lights, mm -hmm. which had to be like a nightmare. <laughs> but uh, it was really, I mean, you know, for most actors, that's a big, you know, it's not a big deal, you know, you take off your clothes. The world demands it. Well, uh, it was a big deal for me. It was hard. And, uh, and so it was, that was a real challenge for me. Now, we've all, I'm people on this panel. I'm a white girl. I know it. Um, so, you know, I, we can't talk about, my, I lived a life of privilege, so to speak. That's really not to my liking. I would like everyone to have privilege, but so that was my biggest challenge, was mm -hmm. like taking off my clothes on stage. Mm -hmm. But I think that as being, there have been other challenges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that being a woman over a certain age and doing nude scenes, which Judith did all the time with a plume, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think that, you know, she talked about it a lot too, actually. So, yeah, that's what I have to offer. Okay. Um, I think I was talking about this at dinner, you know, last night a little bit on the, the train ride up. I did a, a memoir piece called Forever that was uh, done at New York Theater Workshop like two years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's a, how, how my mother unconsciously introduced me to art, you know, because when I think about what was in my house, LaBelle's Bolero was in my house. Uh, James Baldwin was in my house. Um, Dickens' Hard Times was in my house. And then when somebody, I was at, it's a long story as, as to how I was to write it. But the thing being is, um, you know, as you get older, I think you begin to look back. When you start hitting, like, I think when you start hitting your mid 40s on up, you, you kind of go, did I do this right? You know, things, you know, your past becomes very, very close. And it's, it's also, uh, and even though it's quote unquote autobiographical, because I'm not interested in that per se. I mean, it's, it still comes down to theater, beginning, middle, end, story, conflict, resolution. <laughs> They've got therapists for that other shit. I don't have to talk <laughs> So, because um, I would like other people to do forever, actually. Um, but it was also, again, being able to, because this is what happens sometimes with the solo, uh, uh, the solo genre specifically. When people write about themselves, do they have the ability to see themselves as characters, mm -hmm. and also do and also see your relatives as characters, mm -hmm. and also to give credence? Because I, for instance, in terms of the art of writing itself, I had to look at the person who was my mother, and she was not always my mother. She was a child. Mm -hmm. She was a person in and of herself, and also again the three fingers pointing back at you to see myself honestly to create this theater piece, not this confessional. But this theater piece. So to do that, I had to really go to a hard place. And somebody who does that, who did that, God rest the dead, who's from this state, they would, they asked Anne Sexton, "Why do you write the way you write?" And her response was, "I have the right to invade my own privacy." Yeah, but it has to be. But, but to add to that, you know, it shouldn't be gratuitous. It shouldn't be just, you know. Um, self-confessional to the point, you know, where, I mean, you have to look at yourself, yes, but again, but also to create this piece and to be, you know, a self-honesty, you know, that really has to come through, but still within the reins of theater. Mm -hmm. 
So that was a hard thing to do, you know, to, mm -hmm. to look at that, to look at these people who I'm related to, to look at myself, but also go, okay, this, how do we do this and really make this work and make this function where, where it's just not my story, but it becomes, mm -hmm. yeah? And I, because I, I saw the piece, and I thought, wow, she's the only one on the stage. I mean, like, and you had those letters, those, you know. Yeah, like, like a live museum, yeah. Well, there yeah. were pictures of my family. It was and, like a museum piece, family. yeah. And I really, you know, because I was still teaching then, and I was thinking about leaving and going back and really sort of, what's next for me as a writer? Do I perform again? Or do I just write for other people? Because I love writing I for love writing actors. You know what I mean? Just do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it thrills me, and I can go home. Um, and, um, or do I work on another novel? So I, I was very, like, more, I went to see you, and I, I remember I was by myself. And I was just like, you know, she was there. She, she wrote it. She was in it. She was wrestling with it. And there was a very tough scene for me towards the end. You know, and it, it's just like reliving being alone on stage. And I thought, I don't know if I can do that. I know, Marshall. But you know, but <laughs> teeny town, we're not alone. Um, but you know, I don't know if I can do that. So the, I was just, you know, I just wanted to hear from all of you those sort of moments of grace and terror mm -hmm. and beauty. I love that word beauty. So I'm connecting it to the conversations we've been having all day. Yeah. What that takes from us and, um, you know, mm -hmm. what you have to bring to it, and the terror of, you know, mm -hmm. going out there and, okay, I'm, you've got this thing I'm doing. doing it. It's a slow strip tease. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. And you wore black. Always. I know. Always. <laughs> <laughs> black on black, baby. <laughs> I would have loved to see you be 56 years old and naked. I think that's really powerful. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do. I mean, I think about that. I think about that. Yeah. So, let's all take our clothes off. <laughs> I was waiting for this part. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the part where they take his clothes off? <laughs> Do we have time? Should we uh, just see if maybe a couple of comments? And yeah, I would have people for questions. questions. Hey, why don't we turn all the lights questions. on? Yeah. Why if there's any questions, we'll, we'll yeah. do that, but we are running over time. So. Okay, yeah. two questions. Uh, up above, and then Carl. Yeah. But that, that way, okay. Is that Ju Pong? Yes. yes. Oh, hi. Hi, my name is Ju Pong. Um, hi. And I work at Goddard College, and many years ago, we brought Robin McCauley as a guest artist. And she worked with our students on this question that has haunted me ever since. <laughs> Who are your people? <laughs> and it haunted me because I'm an immigrant from Taiwan, and I am supposed, I feel like I'm supposed to say my people are the Taiwanese. And in one sense they are, but in another sense, you are my people. Mm -hmm. You know, the artists, mm -hmm. creators are my people. And um, so my question is, I would love to hear from each of you what that struggle looks like. Is it, or is it the struggle, you know, to, with that question of who are your people? several responses and at first I was listening to you and really just hearing and listening about your question and who you are and I was thinking oh that would be a beautiful piece for you to start mm -hmm. to work on and I, that's where I was going it's a great title thinking, too yes. yeah. who are your people yes mm -hmm. and <coughs> how we are to be, you know, to be asking and to be discerning and to be deciding and um, the challenge. Mm -hmm. 
with that, but yet at that same time when you said and you were looking down us, we are your people. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to say, I'm happy I'm your people, <laughs> and you're my people, and <coughs> that is that feeling, right, when you're ma making mm -hmm. art and that feeling, mm -hmm. and I think that's why many of us within uh, in theater, a little bit different than the visual arts, which I'm trained in, uh, but in, in the theater arts, that feeling of a family or a connection when you're working there together and the commitment and everything that you're doing, even in that sense within that audience, there's nothing like it. And mm. uh, that's why I, as opposed to even that film experience. Uh, so as I say, it's yes, uh, I hear, hear you about that. Anyone else want to address this beautiful comment and question? Or this beautiful question, because I know whenever I'm on the subway, I'm very unashamed about looking at everybody around me, <laughs> and, uh, and it's really something because, and I know this is going to really sound candy ass, and I don't mean it to. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm from that generation, mm. but uh, now I, <laughs> I just I, I just feel when I look at people, well, that's my creature, that's my person, that's it. it, it nobody looks different to me. Everybody sort of looks like I mean, not that I don't notice obvious differences, of course, but it's nothing that I negate. It's just like. Nobody looks different to me. I feel like I know everybody. Mm. And mm. it's really weird. But, um, and I want to say one other thing that I was going to say later on. But uh, I had an early marriage. My first marriage was early. And my first husband's parents were. Uh, Midwesterners and alcoholics and very troubled people. And uh, my father-in-law, when he met me, told me, well, you know, a Jew is just a nigger turned inside out. Mm. <laughs> How long did you stay? <laughs> Two weeks after that. Oh, yeah. oh in the marriage? No, five years. <laughs> oh. But it wasn't my husband, it was the parents. But, you know, Interesting that he didn't wor use the word kike, since he, you know, mm -hmm. used the other pejorative. Mm -hmm. But I guess Jew was bad enough for him. Uh, and so I, I've never really felt marked by my Jewishness because I'm not an observant Jew, but I certainly am part of that uh, tribe. But you know. I, I think we find so many artificial ways to separate ourselves from each other, and it's bad enough that we have skin. I, I, I mean, just skin, that we can never really, really, but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's all. Yeah, did you have any? Well, I think, uh, you know, you, I mean, you know, the, the, the family of artists, and I mean that, that, that's a whole entity in and of itself, you know, but even in terms of like everyday thing, you know, lack of integration means retrogression. Retrogression means eventually extinction, you know, and so you can't help but not have things be. Uh, 1921 is when Noble Sissel and Louis, uh, uh, Louis Blake went to, I'm sorry, 1926, went to Paris to do a play called Shuffle Along. Right. And Shuffle Along introduced the world to uh, Josephine Baker. Mm -hmm. And one person that was there to greet them was Stravinsky. And Stravinsky said, I, it's very important that I meet you because you are the music that I am playing. Uh, when, um, yeah, you are the music that I am playing. Uh, Charlie Parker, had to meet Stravinsky because he said, I wrote Billy's Bout because of listening to you. Mm -hmm. 
So this is what I mean, all of this is integrated. It's, when you read Shakespeare, you read the work of Ben Johnson. When you read Ben Johnson, you read the work of Terence. Terence was a North African. So this is what I mean I'm saying. It's like you cannot have, I mean, even in terms of the logistics of where art comes from, you cannot have one without the other. So yeah, it's, yeah, you're Taiwanese, but you're also a lot of different men. I am as well. I mean, you know, uh, within the course of the day, you know, I might be listening to Van Morrison. I, you know, I might be listening to Patti Smith. I might be listening to Bowie. I might be listening to, you know what I'm saying? It's like when, when somebody tries to pigeonhole me, I'm the wrong person for you to come to that shit. <laughs> 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 like, you know, so like that, you know what I'm saying? It's like you can't, you can't have one without the other. Yeah. So. Yeah. And is, one is more, okay? is that right? Is it okay if we don't we just yeah. We're way over. It's now. a beautiful place to end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you so much. <laughs>